So I'll be uploading quiz two and the assignment two over the weekend. Quiz two will be due next week and it will be all on the gradient descent and optimization stuff, some of the stuff that we have done so far. And then assignment two is based on the gradient descent algorithms and, and you will have to implement something on MATLAB. So make sure that you brush up on your MATLAB. And I'll do that over the weekend, sometime on Saturday or sometime on Sunday, I'll upload both the things, quiz two and assignment two. Oh, on September 22nd, which is a Wednesday, I have some meeting that goes all the way from 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. So I'll not be holding a class on that day. I have to attend that meeting. Uh, so September 22nd, I'll send out an email, email to everyone and you will have that information through email. But I just wanted to announce it in the class. Okay, so today uh, we have talked about gradient descent algorithm for solving unconstrained optimization. We have talked about Gauss-Newton's method for solving least square problem. So least square is a very special class of unconstrained optimization problem. So we'll continue the same line of thought today and we'll consider a very special class of unconstrained optimization problem and we'll uh, talk about conjugate gradient method for solving that optimization problem. So that's the topic for today's class. Conjugate gradient method. So what is the problem that we want to solve? I want to minimize a quadratic optimization, quadratic affine optimization pro problem. So this is the quadratic term and this is the affine term. And my x is in Rn. Q is of course positive definite. And B is a vector in Rn. Q is a positive definite matrix and B is a vector in Rn. Can someone tell me what the solution to this problem is? What x star is? Q inverse times b. Q inverse times b. Uh, Q inverse times b. Let's see why this is the case. So this is a convex problem, right? Because the second derivative of this objective function is a positive definite matrix. So it's a convex problem. So the way to compute x star is to set the first derivative equal to zero. For convex function, that's what we need to do. So the first derivative gradient of f at x star is q x star minus b. That's equal to zero. This of course implies that x star is Q inverse B. <coughs> X star is Q inverse B. Why are we even studying this problem? I don't know. Like, this seems to be an easy operation. Can't we just invert the matrix, multiply it, and do it? What's the problem? Why are we studying this formulation? When is, when is a matrix inverse a difficult problem? It's a singular matrix. Sorry? If it's a singular matrix. Well, it's not singular here because this is positive definite. Very large. very large, right? So Q is very, very large matrix. So you could have two situations. One is Q is literally very large, like a billion cross billion matrix. Uh, so therefore, you can't really do the inverse just like that. Or alternatively, you are running this algorithm on a microprocessor. 
and Q is like 15 dimensional, and your FPGA cannot handle, your, your microcontroller cannot handle inverting a 15 cross 15 matrix. It will just hang or it will take, a, I don't know, two, three hours to do the inverse. So you don't want to, uh, you don't want, you cannot solve this problem just by inverting a matrix. So you want to come up with an iterative method that either computes X star or at least gets close to X star in fewer number of iterations. So maybe uh, Q is a 200 dimensional matrix and it will take you 200 steps to get to the optimal solution. But perhaps in 50 steps you are close to the optimal solution. And so you just want to stop there. You don't want to go all the way to 200 steps and get the truly optimal solution. You are happy with an approximately optimal solution. So we want to come up with an iterative way to get either close to X star or compute X star without really inverting a matrix, just by using simple matrix multiplication and, and things like that. So that's the goal of conjugate gradient method. So how do we go about conjugate gradient method? So let's talk about conjugate directions, something that you have done in your homework one. So I have d0 to dn minus 1, these are conjugate directions. What that means, di transpose q dj is equal to 0 for all i not equal to j. So these are q conjugate directions. So these are the vectors such that di transpose q dj is equal to 0. So I'm running this algorithm on a microcontroller and God came and told me what are the Q conjugate directions for this 15 dimensional optimization problem. So I got this Q conjugate directions from some third party entity that I, that, that's giving me these matrices for free. Oh, sorry, not matrices, the vectors for free. Given that you have Q conjugate directions which satisfies this condition, I can solve the following problem xk plus 1 equals xk plus alpha k dk and I'm going to pick alpha k according to this fashion, argmin greater than 0, f of xk plus alpha dk. So this is the line, uh, this is the minimization rule. So I have uh, conjugate directions given to me and I can use minimization rule to solve this problem. This is the way I'm going to run the, this is not a gradient descent yet, okay? This is just descending in some direction. This DK is not related to gradient at this point of time. We will make it related to gradient in a, in a few minutes. Now let's try to figure out what value of alpha k should be. Okay, so this, this is a convex problem. So f is a convex function. It turns out that this optimization argmin alpha greater than, oh, actually in this case, I think it's alpha is an r, not greater than zero. Because dk could take any value. And therefore alpha can take any value. Yeah, that's right, alpha is an r. I apologize for that. So alpha is an R, and I can solve this minimization problem 
using um, using just uh, setting the first derivative equal to zero type expression. So let's try to do that. I want to compute what is d over d alpha f of xk plus alpha dk. Can someone tell me what this derivative should look like? I think, yeah. So this derivative is actually this is a directional derivative. So when you take the derivative with respect to alpha, uh, this is what you get. Gradient of fxk plus alpha dk transpose dk. And remember that alpha star, this must be equal to zero because this objective function as a function of alpha is a convex problem because it's a quadratic problem in X. So I can uh, compute the derivative. So that's Q of XK plus alpha xk plus alpha k dk transpose dk equals to zero. I should write alpha equals to alpha k. Because alpha k is the argument there. So this is what I get. This is the derivative of f. Oh, I, I think there is a minus b as well. Minus b transpose ek equals to 0. Now I need to unpack this whole expression. How do I do that? Let's, uh, let's try to unpack this expression. So I want my alpha k to be on one side of the equation, and I want rest of the stuff to be on the other side of the equation. So I have alpha k times dk transpose q dk minus b minus q xk transpose dk equals to zero. Everyone agrees with this? Does it look correct? I think it looks okay. Looks correct. This term is strictly positive, right? So I can do the division. Division is perfectly fine. And that's because dk is a vector, and I have dk transpose q dk. So I can do the division with this particular number. And so I get alpha k equals to, let me write on the other side. So I have alpha k. is dk transpose b minus qxk over dk transpose qdk. Any questions so far?
So I have a quadratic optimization problem. Someone gave me conjugate directions for that particular space. And I want to run this algorithm, uh, xk plus 1 plus is equal to xk plus alpha k dk. So dk is given. Uh, alpha k is computed according to the minimization rule. <coughs> But the minimization is over the entire real axis. It's not alpha greater than zero, but it's over the entire real line. And by doing this minimization, I come figure out that alpha k can be given as, it's given by dk transpose b minus qxk over dk transpose qdk. So this is a positive number. This is some scalar. So this division is perfectly fine. And uh, and the other thing I'm noticing is that all of this is just matrix manipulation, matrix multiplication, okay? No inverse, no complicated inverse happening here. And matrix multiplication is, a, is our favorite operation. Okay. Let me state a fact without proof about this particular algorithm and then we will Uh, then if we are going to make dk, uh, we, we will make dk related to the, uh, the gradient in, in, in a short while. So what is the fact? So let me, call, let me define mk to be the set of all x, x0 plus beta1 d1, d beta0 d0 plus beta k dk. Beta naught to beta k are all real numbers. So this is known as a, uh, it's a hyperplane in n-dimensional space. If you want to visualize it in three-dimensional space, a hyperplane is either a plane or a line. Okay, uh, it could, it doesn't have to go through the origin. But in this case, it has to go through x naught, which is your initial condition. So this plane, this hyperplane is going through x naught, and it's just a hyperplane in the space. And in three dimension, a hyperplane is like a plane, or it's a line. So the fact is, xk plus 1 is argmin f of x, x in mk. So we are, xk plus 1 will be the minimum value of the function as long as you are restricting yourself to this particular hyperplane. Any questions so far? Okay, we won't prove this result, but the book has a proof. It's like a six, seven lines of proof, but it's purely matrix multiplication, manipulation, and some, uh, and using this fact that d, d, d1 to dn minus one is conjugate direction. So you use that fact and you, you get this particular result. But so far, this is a conjugate direction method. This is a conjugate direction method because the directions are given. You are running this optimization problem. And this is the kind of result you get. And as you proceed into the optimization, the value of your alpha k is going to get smaller and smaller because you're getting close to the optimal solution. And once you are sufficiently close, where alpha k is very, very small, so you're not really making any progress, in terms of your optimization, you can just terminate and say that you are at an approximately optimal solution because your alpha k is small, so you're not proceeding in the towards, no, you are proceeding towards the optimal solution, but the step size is too small, so you don't really want to 
uh, do more matrix multiplication and try to get to the optimal solution. You are happy with an approximately optimal solution. Now the problem in this particular conjugate gradient method is somebody has to give you these conjugate directions and the conjugate directions depend on the matrix Q. <clears throat> so if the Q changes during operation, you have to come up with conjugate directions all over again. That's a complicated exercise. So what do we want to do is somehow generate these conjugate directions on the fly. So somehow I want to generate this DK on the fly. So I have D0, I come up with D0 somehow, and then I'll generate D1 when the time comes to, to, to do the optimization here, I'll generate D1, I'll take a step, then I'll generate D2, then I'll take a step and so on. And what do we know from our assignment? Uh, let me remind you, this is the result you had gotten in your assignment. So we, I had given you C0 to C n minus one, and you came up with, given these vectors, these are vectors in Rn, and these are linearly independent. vectors, you generated dk as follows. So d0 was c0, d1 was, anyone remember, c1 plus c1, 0, c0. And then d2 was c1, c2 plus c21, d1. Let me write it as D0. C21 D1 plus C20 D0 and so on, right? This is something you did in assignment one. Assignment one, question two. And the result was since everyone has submitted the assignment, I can tell you what the result is. CK plus one I is equal to minus CK plus one transpose QDI over DI transpose QDI. Okay. Does this expression look correct? Right, okay. Good. How do I connect it to the gradient method? So we have been talking about gradient so far. What should we do so that we are explicitly incorporating gradient in this optimization? What should our, what, what would be a natural choice for C0 in this case? If you want to connect it to the gradient method. Any thoughts? So here is one way to think about it. Let me take C0 to be minus gradient of F at X, uh, X, X0, yeah, yeah, minus gradient of F at X0. C1 to be minus gradient F of X1, C2 to be minus gradient F of X2 and so on, right? So as I'm proceeding in my optimization, I'm computing the gradient, I have to compute the gradient uh, because this is a great, I want to make it a gradient method and the gradient will tell me whether I'm close to the optimal solution or far away from the optimal solution. So I'm computing the gradient 
And I need a bunch of linearly independent vectors to come up with conjugate gradients. Uh, so let's just take the gradients itself as the set of linearly independent vectors. Does that make sense? Does this choice of C appear natural to you? Right, you have to compute it anyway, so why not just take them to be negative of gradients? Okay. So I'm going to pick CK to minus gradient FXK, no, CK plus 1 will be minus gradient FXK, which is B minus QXK. Oh, and D naught, D naught of course is minus gradient of FX naught. Let's try to compute what C10 looks like. That's uh, minus B minus QX0 transpose Q D0. D0 is B minus QX0. Uh, wait a second. Oh, that is C1 is minus gradient of Fx1. So, sorry. This is B minus Qx1 transpose Q B minus Qx0 over D0 transpose Qd0. So, B minus Qx0 transpose Q B minus Qx0. Is the, how, how easy or difficult is it to compute C10? So, yes, please. Oh, uh, let me see what's there in the book. So D0 is gradient of Fx0, which is fine. And CK is, okay, sorry. So it's actually CK. I, I, I wrote it wrong in my notes. You are right. Thank you. So CK is, as we mentioned, it's equal to minus gradient of Fxk. So please make that correction. This is CK. So after a lot of algebra, okay, so my question was, does this seem like a complicated operation? Not really, because I have to compute the gradient, I have to compute the gradient, I can just store it in the memory, and then this is just a matrix multiplication, this is just a matrix multiplication. So even though I'm writing a lot of pluses and minuses, these are actually vectors that are already stored in the memory. And then I just have to do the matrix multiplication and, and that's it, I'm, I'm done. So in fact, if I, um, if you think about it, 
uh, q times b minus q x naught is appearing both in the numerator and the denominator. So you have to compute this only once. And then you have to do the matrix multiplication, the vector, vector transpose another vector and vector transpose another vector one. So it's actually very easy to execute this on a, on a small microcontroller if you have to, or even on a large machine if the matrices are very large. Because you have storage, you have ample amount of storage available to do this computation. So all of these C's will be very easy to compute, but actually once you do some algebra, here is another fact that you will learn. Again, the proof is in the book. My DK is going to be equal to CK plus beta K DK minus one. So all the other values are zero and beta K is CK transpose CK over transpose CK minus one. So this comes after quite a few simplifications. This is a, I'll give you the number, proposition 2.1.1, 1.1 in the third edition of nonlinear programming book. And there's a whole bunch of uh, algebra that you have to do to get to that particular expression. Now look at what is happening. So I have to compute the gradient and I, I let that be equal to CK and then I'm, I'm getting DK on the fly. And not only that, I need to compute this coefficients beta K, but beta K itself is actually very simplified expression. So all in all, I have to store in the memory DK minus one CK and CK minus one, and I can generate DK on the fly. And this method is known as conjugate gradient method. So we are explicitly using gradient and the knowledge of conjugate directions to solve this particular problem. Now in reality, uh, you can actually, uh, so this optimal solution will be found in n time steps. So xn will always be equal to x star. Let me write it. So um, what I wanted to write was xn will be equal to x star, which will be equal to q inverse b. But as you can see, we didn't have to invert any matrix here. We computed the gradients, uh, sorry, conjugate direction on the fly. We did some matrix manipulation. We uh, ran the algorithm xk plus one equals to xk plus alpha k dk. And after n time steps, I arrive at the optimal solution, x star, q inverse b. Now if n is 10 raised to six, inverting this matrix is too difficult, but still there is an iterative way by which you just have to do vector manipulation or vector multiplication, and you can get to this solution in 10 raised to six time steps. However, 
in 1,000 time steps or 2,000 time steps, you will be close to the optimal solution. And you can just quit the optimization problem at that time because your gradient of fx1000 is close to 0. Right? So you can keep running a while loop. OK, so while the gradient of f is small, is, is greater than epsilon, you can keep doing conjugate gradient method. And as soon as your tolerance level is reached, epsilon equals to 10 raised to minus 2 or 10 raised to minus 3, you can exit and say that, OK, fine, I'm done. You know, I'm close to the optimal solution. And in this case, x1000 is approximately optimal which is what we typically want in optimization. So you don't have to go all the way to 10 raised to 6 iterations. You can get to the approximately optimal solution in a much fewer number of time steps. Any questions so far? So that's difficult to know because we don't know what your tolerance level is. If you want to get all the way to X star, you probably haven't saved too much. Um, however, there is still some savings, OK? And why is there savings? So you don't want to compute Q. So Q inverse is not what you are interested in in this problem. What you are interested in is Q inverse times B, Q inverse multiplied by B. And what this computes is not Q inverse, but Q inverse multiplied by B, right? So you're still saving and not doing as many computation as is needed in computing Q inverse and then multiplying it by B. So in that case, you have far more knowledge. You have the knowledge of Q inverse. But in this particular case, nowhere in, during the algorithm you have that knowledge of Q inverse. So you're still saving some amount of effort in not being able to invert this matrix and, uh, but, but you can get to the optimal solution much faster and therefore you don't really, you, the co computational complexity will be much more dif uh, like difficult to evaluate because you don't know what the tolerance level is. However, uh, you will be running this algorithm on a thousand cross thousand matrix in your assignment too. So, so you will automatically be able to figure out, like let your MATLAB do inversion of a thousand cross thousand matrix, positive definite matrix. Uh, hopefully it won't crash. Uh, you know, so the, the reason why I'm saying it is I have run, I mean, I have been running computers for a very long time. And I have had a laptop which had like a one gigabyte of RAM or something like that, or maybe like 512 MB of RAM. And I couldn't do the inversion of a thousand cross thousand matrix in that particular computer. So it would crash, MATLAB would crash if I try to invert a thousand cross thousand matrix. So I have seen those computers in my lifetime. Uh, but I'm not sure if you have seen those computers in your lifetime. Uh, nonetheless, you can run this algorithm on MATLAB and it works beautifully without any problem. This is easy stuff for MATLAB to do. OK. Any other question? Now let's try to extend this algorithm. So conjugate gradient method, uh, this algorithm is designed for quadratic problems, quadratic optimization problems. Uh, but we can extend this to nonlinear optimization problems. And here is the way. It's actually a sort of a clever way to extend it to nonlinear optimization problems. So I want to minimize f of x, x is in Rn. And for some reason, I am choosing conjugate gradient method to solve this problem. Then my dk, I'm just going to define it as
okay alpha k again has to be picked according to the minimization rule unconstrained minimization rule but this is how you would run the gradient descent algorithm in this case there is a slight difference in this problem uh, so in slight difference in the expression for beta k in that problem and in this problem so in this problem beta k is gradient of fxk transpose gradient of fxk in this problem it's gradient of fxk transpose gradient of fxk minus gradient of fxk minus 1 so there is a small difference in the way beta k is computed and there is a reason for that and the reason is in the quadratic case this gradient of fxk transpose gradient of fxk minus 1 is actually 0. Okay? So therefore, that term gets cancelled. So if I write it as minus ck minus 1, I know that ck transpose ck minus 1 is actually 0. So I don't have to write it here. But then, in this case, it is non-zero. And so you have to write it. But nonetheless, this is a way to extend the conjugate gradient method from the quadratic case to the non-quadratic case. But uh, of course, this is not the most, this is not the best algorithm to, to use for, for general nonlinear optimization. But if your function is nearly quadratic, perhaps this is a good algorithm to try. Give it a shot and see if, if it makes the cut over other gradient descent methods. Okay. Any question so far? Okay. All right. So we talked about conjugate gradient method. It's a class of gradient method for unconstrained optimization for quadratic function and then we extended it to non-quadratic functions and this is not of course a superior algorithm but it, it can potentially work for some of the use cases that you might encounter so we don't know about it uh, but uh, hopefully you will get it you will get to try it on some problem in the future um, what we are going to talk about next is a approximate or quasi-Newton method. That's what we will talk in the next class. So I'll just give you an introduction. And then we can adjourn for today. So the next topic is quasi-Newton method. And the idea in quasi-Newton method is as follows. I have a minimization problem. And the Newton's method is asking me to do the following. This is what Newton's method is asking me to do. Take the second derivative, invert the matrix, and multiply it by the gradient, and pick an appropriate alpha k, and then run the gradient descent. That's Newton's method. What did we learn in the least square method? The, sorry, not the least square. What was it called? The, how can I forget that algorithm? What did we study before conjugate direction method? What was that algorithm? Gauss-Newton's method. Yeah, Gauss-Newton's method, sorry. 
So in Gauss-Newton's method, what did we learn about, we learned something special about Newton's method. Uh, what, what exactly did we do there in Gauss-Newton's method? We didn't really compute the second derivative of f because that was complicated. So we took an approximation of the second derivative of f. So we replaced this term by something that's approximately equal to second derivative of f at xk inverse. And we still got some speed up uh, properties of the Newton's method. So in quasi-Newton's method, the idea is, hey, look, I'm computing xk, xk plus 1, xk plus 2, and so on. So I have all these vectors. And because I have these vectors, I can take the, I can subtract xk with xk minus 1, and xk, uh, xk minus 1 with xk minus 2, and so on. And perhaps I can infer some curvature information about the function by just looking at these successive points. So if this is my xk, this is my xk plus 1, this is my xk plus 2, this is my xk plus 3, perhaps I can do some matrix manipulation to get the curvature information about the function in this particular area. And once I get the curvature information, I can do the inverse and I can multiply it by the gradient and I can run a approximate Newton's method, a quasi-Newton's method. <clears throat> now here is the trick. When you are trying to construct the second derivative, you could update the second derivative matrix in multiple ways, right? What quasi-Newton's method tries to do is do a rank two update. Rank two update means <clears throat> I have the second derivative matrix inverse at this point of time. I need to compute the second derivative inverse at the next time step. I'm going to add a rank two matrix to the current second derivative inverse and get an approximate second derivative inverse at the next time step. So it's a rank two update. So what we are going to study is I'm going to replace this matrix by dk at time k and I'm going to do a rank 2 update of dk. So dk plus 1 will be dk plus uh, some a, a transpose or a, k, a, k transpose plus b, k, b, k transpose. So this is rank 2 update. So this is a usual positive definite inverse matrix. This is a rank 1 matrix. This is a rank one matrix. So this is total, it's a rank two matrix. <clears throat> so what we will do in the next class is try and come up with this rank two matrix that I can add to dk and I get dk plus one. Okay, that's what we will study. And this whole algorithm is called quasi-Newton's method so one thing that I'll talk about is why rank one update is not good enough. Okay, there's a problem with rank one update. So you have to go to rank two update. And then the whole method works beautifully. And, uh, and we'll study the theory of that, this particular method in the next class. Thank you. Okay, so why is this a rank two matrix? So a rank one matrix, this is a rank one matrix, okay? Why is it a rank one matrix? So let's uh, look at one, two, okay? So what is A, A transpose? One, two, one, two, One, two, two, four. How many linearly independent columns it has? Only one, right? So it's a rank one matrix. This is true for any dimension. I'm just demonstrating it in two dimension. So it's a rank one matrix. And when you have two such matrices, 
A A transpose and B B transpose, you add them, and A and B are not linearly, I mean they are not linearly dependent, or rather they are linearly independent. Then it's a rank two matrix. Okay, sure. Any other question? Okay. Uh, have a good weekend, and I'll see you guys on Monday.